Good evening to everyone. Evening. Good to see everyone out this evening. Hope everyone had a had a good afternoon, took advantage of the weather, and and uh, maybe even possibly got a nap in. So it's good to see everyone back this evening. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you came our way. We welcome you back at every opportunity. And, uh, we're going to go ahead and get into our announcements at this time. Those who are requesting prayers at this time. Gilbert White's niece, Tonda Cottrell, has asked for prayers for a medical condition. Also, Danny Carpenter Sr. had an appointment with an oncologist on Monday. He is scheduled for an appointment, another appointment to consider radiation treatments. I believe upon speaking with them this morning that the, the treatments, are they scheduled yet? No, he has a, a meeting with Another the meeting, okay. And uh, they're, they're going to do like they did with me, the Department of Radiation. Okay. So they'll put him on, uh, on, a, on this table and slide him into a, uh, uh, like a CAT scan machine or, a, or an MRI machine. Mm -hmm. And just to uh, mark where they need to target, then they'll put little dots like periods and little tattoos on there. Okay. So they can line it up perfectly every time. And that's what they're going to do usually. And then they'll discuss. When the uh, when the treatments will actually start, it'll be every day, Monday through Friday for four weeks. Okay. I right, thank you for that update. I appreciate it. And then we had a conversation this morning, but I just couldn't remember the details. Thank you, Roy. Also, uh, please pray for Ruth Ann Lemon as she deals with health concerns. And Connie Lynch is still weak and struggling. Please keep her in your prayers and her family as they um, help to take care of her. Now, Donnie Hendershot is going to have radi radiation treatments coming in the near future. Please remember Paul Basemeyer's Aunt Sharon with her heart condition. Delbert White may have eye surgery in the near future as well. Now, this one I kind of messed up this morning, so bear with me. Roy Clark's sister, Susie, her mother, passed away in Florida. Please keep this family in your prayers during this trying time. Rhonda Facemeyer's sister, Carter's husband, had skin surgery and is waiting uh, for the biopsy results. Robin Kessinger has been suffering from heart trouble. And this is Dan Kessinger's brother. I talked to Robin the other day and uh, he, he thought they were going to release him. Uh, they still, uh, he'll, he'll be undergoing tests for the next uh, several weeks to figure out why his heart, um, it was only operating at like 25%. And so we're able to get his electrolytes uh, back in balance okay. and uh, get the arrhythmia thing straightened out. And he said he, he was pretty sure they were going to send him home. And I think that was Friday. Okay. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's had heart troubles for a long time. And he's, he's not out of the woods by any means. So please continue to keep coming to her. And uh, this is uh, Dan Kessinger from out of Pensburg, correct? Yeah. Okay. This is right. Okay. Um, are there any other announcements for those uh, in regards to those who are on the prayer list? In the way of upcoming events, next Sunday, the 3rd, will be the uh, monthly song service at 6 o'clock. And along that lines, this coming weekend will be uh, fall back an hour, Saturday night, early Sunday morning. Be sure Saturday night to send your set your clocks back an hour and for the for the end of daylight savings time. Friday, November the 15th will be the Friday night sing. This will be at Camden Avenue Church of Christ at 7 o'clock. And then coming up November 24th, the traveling youth group will be at the Newport Church of Christ. Are there any other announcements for upcoming events? Before we get into um, our first song there, I just wanted to, 
Again, thank Elvis and Ann for the years of service that they have put in here at Sunrise. Our thoughts and prayers are with you and uh, will continue to be with you as you begin your new work in Coverage Plains. And, uh, uh, we love both of you very much. With that, our first song will be number 412. Number 412. <clears throat> On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Acts 
chapter 3, verses 3 through 9, a lame man healed. Who seen, seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him, with John and Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Please bow with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this opportunity that we have to gather together to worship your high and holy name. Father, we pray that the things said and done here this evening are pleasing in your sight. We pray, Father, that you will be with us here as we labor here at sunrise, that you will bless our efforts to spread your gospel to those that we come in contact with. We pray, Father, that you will bless Ann and Ellis as they begin a new work. We pray that much good might come from their efforts, Lord. Father, we're so grateful for all the many wonderful things that you surround us with day by day. Far too many to count. Father, <clears throat> we pray that you would be with those of our number that are sick. We pray that you would be with them and those that are caring for them, that they might soon regain your health. Pray, Father, that you will be with those that are grieving and lost loved ones, that you will give them the comfort they need in this trying time. Father, we ask that uh, as we go through our lives, that you will be with each of us, that you will help us all, Father, to always carefully consider the things that we're about to say or do. We might act according to your will. We ask, Father, you will forgive us for we have sinned against you in the past. And we pray, Father, that when our lives here are ended, we might have that happen and return home with you in heaven. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Song number 514. Number 514. <clears throat> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in
number 603. And if you'd like to mark the Song of Invitation, number 692. <clears throat> Walking alone and even, viewing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to what a be silver star. person, but you can see some of those on Facebook, I do believe, on her account. Or our accounts probably share those. I want to take our minds back to Saul the Apostle, or the Saul before he became an Apostle, excuse me, and think about the faith that he had in Judaism for a second. You know, we, we kind of look at Saul the Apostle, we're going to get to that in just a second, but I want you to think where he started from. He was a man that was very convinced of his religion, wasn't he? He was so convinced of his religion that he would basically uh, fight people, if you will, for his religion. 
He, he was the type of person that, that would do anything to protect his religion in Judaism. He was trained up, as we looked at last week, by one of the best teachers that he could be trained up with. He grew up in this religion, and, and he thought this was the religion to be in. But something spectacular happened to him as he was on his way to Damascus. His purpose for going to Damascus was to find Christians, people of the way, to arrest them, to drag them back to Jerusalem, to try them for being Christians, many times to even kill them. But something happened while he was on the way, a bright light, and you can envision this in, in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 3 or so, this bright light shining from heaven. And, and the Bible says in the New American Standard, it flashed from heaven. And it must have been such a bright flashing that it just got his attention where he was blinded. And, and he fell to the ground, and he begins a conversation. He says, who are you, Lord? Obviously, he knew that something had happened, someone had happened, and he, and he, and he began hearing this voice, and, and, and he said, I'm, you know, Saul, why are you persecuting now me? And he says, it's hard to kick against the goads. And, and he says, you must go into the city, and you'll be told what to do. It's interesting because we always look at the question, what must I do to be saved? That question really didn't lay out here, but it was seemed to be... The intent of the conversation didn't. It? No one said it according to scripture, but it seems to be the flavor of it. And so he was blinded and he remained blind and, and for a time. And he was going to go into the city. And, and of course, he, he's there praying. And, and finally, Ananias comes to him and tells him what he must be do to be saved. Acts 22 and verse 16. This. this conversion story is recorded in three different places in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. And when you see it in these three places and, and piece it all together to get kind of a full picture of that, Acts 22, 16, why do you wait? The question was, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so last week we start to look at Saul of Tarsus and, and we discuss a, a little bit about his past and, and, and a little bit about his upbringing. And, and, and as he went down his life, we looked at his religious beliefs as a Pharisee. And we looked at the basically five different sects of the Jews and, and how the Pharisees were the strictest of the Jews. And, and certainly Paul was from, or Saul at that time was from that sect. And then we learned from Galatians chapter uh, 1 and verse 15 oh, there it goes. Um, that God set him apart for the work of an evangelist at his mother's womb and, and what a wonderful thing that was so tonight we're going to conclude this story with two things first Paul the Christian and evangelist this seems to be the, the what he's doing what he's going to do he's going to be an evangelist and he just began to believe in God, it seems like. And, and we come to what he writes near the end of his life, and this is the advice that he gives to a young preacher, Timothy. As he now is a seasoned preacher, and he says, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will have accumulated for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to fables and myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So this advice was for Paul, but now as he was an older preacher, this was certainly for Timothy, and this advice was certainly for Titus. And while Saul was en route to Damascus, we, the, the, the resurrected and ascended Christ appeared to him. And so make no mistake, this seemed to be Jesus that appeared to him on this road. And Jesus' appearance to Saul revealed 
four potential things that we want to look at tonight. First, the head, Christ, and the body, the church, are one. The head, Christ, the body, you and I, the church, are one. Notice Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Paul says, and he put all things subject under his feet. Subjection under his feet. Gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we're subject to the head, we're subject to Christ, and, and, and we're one with Christ. We're the body of Christ, if you will, the church. Now notice that Saul was breathing out these murderous threats and, and, and the slander against the disciples of the Lord. And we notice that Saul was, was trying to destroy the way, destroy the church, his labors would be futile. And, and, and vain, and it was hard for him to kick against the gold or the pricks. And this word means the awareness, it's a metaphor for the gospel, hearts, the, prick, the pricks that had been awakened, the saw, and, and an awareness that he might not be right in opposing Christianity. And, and I want to think about this for a second because he was going so hard into Judaism, if you will, and one time Judaism was right, but he, now he needs to be in Christianity, and so he was fighting so hard about it. And sometimes we see people that are fighting so hard in the religion that they were born in or went to or something like that, that sometimes they're, they'll defend that, but they're afraid to open their Bible and look in their Bible. Sometimes they don't want to know the truth or, or may say they want, don't want to know the truth or would argue just about anything to just about be right when, you know, Saul was not right. And, and he needed that message from God, and that message was so strong that it changed his life completely. I mentioned this before, that, that you know, it's interesting when you sit down and you open the Bible and do a Bible study and someone learns the truth, it's interesting to see their reaction. Because a lot of times they're like, I can't believe that I was believing something else. I can't believe that I was believing a lie. And, and, you know, you have them read it right from the Word of God, right from the Scripture. Well, thirdly, we notice this. The Lord's appearance, the Lord's appearance to Saul brought about an awareness to him that he was a sinner. And he didn't really catch that before. Sometimes we don't catch that, do we? We're sinners. You know, we're, we're all in that same boat, aren't we? We're, we're all in the Titanic, if you will. The, the boat's going down, and if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus to save us, then, then we would be in trouble. But he realized that he must be changed, and certainly we must be changed, and become transformed. 1 Timothy chapter 1 Verses 12 to 15 says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me in the service. Even though I was formerly, this is Paul talking about himself, he was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a vigilant aggressor, Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was more than abundant. Oh, we need to be grateful for his grace. With the faith and the love that which are found in Christ Jesus, it's a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, now, there's your statement that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. And if we say we're sinners, then he came, save, came to save us. Now, Paul would say, of whom I'm chief of, or of whom I'm foremost. That was his personal feeling, if you will. 
I, I've seen people over the years that I might say, well, this person seemed to be more of a sinner than, you know, you might look at a mass murderer or something like that, and say, well, this person seemed to be more of a sinner than Paul. But Paul would say, I'm chief of this. I, you know, and that's in his mind. I, I'm, I'm the worst sinner, and if, if Jesus came into the world to save me, certainly he could say, all of us. Well, fourthly, we notice that Jesus appeared to Saul to make him a minister to the Gentiles. Now, it's interesting because if we were kind of running the show, if we were God for a minute, we would probably say, well, Saul, born a Jew, will make him a minister to the Jews. I think that's kind of the way we would think of it, but we aren't, and we weren't, and we never will be, so God did this the way he wanted to be. Christ did this the way he wanted. He made him a minister to the Gentiles, and, and, and I think we should be grateful for that. Notice Acts chapter 26 and verse 16, but get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also the things which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to win, or excuse me, to whom I am sending you to open their eyes. Here's the purpose. What's the purpose of, of talking to somebody about the church? What's the purpose of opening the Bible with somebody? What's the purpose of sharing our faith? You know, there has to be a, a, a purpose for all these things. And, and we see the purpose here in Acts chapter 16, verse 28. It's to open their eyes. Now, I could tell you a Ronald Reagan joke. I love Ronald Reagan jokes. But since this is the political season, probably not proper for me to do that. But I, I'll tell you this much of it. If you know the puppy joke that he tells us, and when he says it's at the second convention, he says those puppies were older because their eyes were open. Go back and listen to all the Ronald Reagan jokes and you'll figure that out. But open their eyes. In other words, you know, we need to open our eyes sometimes to the truth. We, you know, people in the world need to open their eyes to the truth. And he says this is the purpose, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness into light from the dominion of Satan to God. They may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Well, what a wonderful purpose. And, and you might say, well, what's our purpose in the church? I'm, I, I'm not a preacher. I'm not an elder. I'm not a deacon. I'm just a regular member. I might have been here for a while. What's my purpose? Your purpose is the same purpose as to open up people's eyes. Now, now, you may not have the access that everybody has, but certainly there's ways with the Word of God that we can do that. Ananias ultimately approached Saul, we mentioned this, in, in the house of Judas while he was in a state of prayer and fasting and penance and baptized Saul into Christ. Saul was a member of the church that Jesus built and became not ashamed of it. He wrote the passage that we mentioned this morning, Romans 1 and verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation of everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Galatians 1, 23, but only they kept hearing he wants, he who wants persecuted us, is now preaching the faith, imagine that, which he once tried to destroy. But the zeal that was so charismatic of Saul prior to his conversion, imagine that, you know, as we thought about that just a few months ago, imagine the zeal that, that Saul must have had to to, to go out and say, I'm going to a different city. I'm going to see these people that are Christians. I'm going to drag them back. It, 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 I, I'm sure God looked at him and said, if only I could turn that zeal around for the church. If we could have people in the church that has that zeal for the gospel of Jesus Christ, wouldn't that be great? 
the amazing fashion Luke mentions that after Saul was baptized, he immediately, and, and, and the King James word used is straightway, began to preach that Christ is the Son of God in the synagogues. And we see that in Acts chapter 9. But remember, in, in chapter 3, or chapter 9, excuse me, chapter 9, verse 3 is when the light. Now, by the word 20, we see this word straightway, or immediately, he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. You know, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of us in, in our culture, in our day and time, say, okay, I've become a Christian, but I don't know much, and so I'm going to take years of training and all these things and think about this. And, 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 and Saul didn't do that. He, he begins preaching that Jesus is the Christ. Saul didn't take a, a seat on the bench, so to speak, after he was saved, but rather made it his life's mission to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever he went. Or wherever he was sent. Colossians 1 23, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and, and, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So we see Paul as a Christian, as an evangelist, but secondly, we see him as a prophetic, prophetic writer. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 says, Paul is called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Suthias, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you see Paul as the author, the first word there, Paul, called to be an apostle. He's the author of 1 Corinthians. There would never be any argument there. And Paul preached the gospel in the synagogues. He debated many of the Jews and the Greeks and even affirmed the faith before magistrates. Acts 24, verse 24 through 26, but some days later, Felix arrived with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewish, and sent for Paul and heard him speak about the faith in Jesus Christ. But as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present. I will find a time when I will summon you. By the way, that's not a good thing, is it? Basically, Felix is kind of interested in becoming a Christian. His wife invites someone over to do a Bible study. And they're having the Bible study. And Felix says, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not going to do this right now. You go away, and I'll let you know when the proper time is, and I'll give you a call. At the same time, too, he was hoping that money would be given him by Paul, therefore, he also used to send for him quite often and converse with him. So he had some side deals there. He was hoping that Paul would pay him, basically. And of course, that never happened that we saw in the Bible. Paul also wrote letters or epistles to congregations and specific persons. Paul, who proposed a Jewish religion background, a Greek education, and knowing Grecian Roman culture was a, a wonderful thing. 2 Peter 3 and verses 15 and 16. And regard the patience of our Lord and Savior, just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you. Also, all in all his letters. Well, Peter, how many letters did he write? I'm going to tell you that, but all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which some things are hard to understand. It's interesting, Peter said, well, some of the Paul's things that he talks about are, are a little bit different, difficult to, to understand. We, we think Peter would know all this. He was an apostle, which the untaught 
and unstable and disordered, they view as the rest of the scriptures and their own to their own destruction. So consider this. Consider there are 27 New Testament books of the Bible. In the New Testament, what we call the canon. And if Paul is credited for penning the book of Hebrews, now we could spend the rest of the next three weeks arguing whether he is or isn't. Many people think he is, and some people think he is. But if he is, as many conservative scholars would set, contribute him to that to, as a Pauline author, he has authored half of the New Testament canon. 14 epistles from Romans the Hebrews, if that's the case, the Hebrews. We know that he has definitely authored 13 of them out of 27. So the numbers are pretty high. So when we look at Paul as an apostle, the information that we get on really how to behave in the church, a large portion of that comes from the apostle Paul. Many of his epistles contain knowledge of Greek culture, of Gentile poems, of Old Testament history, of quotes from the Old Testament prophets, of examples from his life experiences. And those, you know, are the most wonderful uh, passages that I love. There's in 2 Corinthians where he talks about being called up into the third heaven. You know, that's a passage to study. Another passage is, is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, a rather lengthy passage there, a lengthy chapter, but, but it's basically how we're changed after we die. In the moment, in the twinkling of a, you know, and you go on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 13 through 18 talks about, you know, don't let the, your heart be troubled. You know, and, and he goes on. And, and, and so we see these things about the afterlife that Paul pins and about being called up and all these things that Paul gives us. And, and that many other writers don't give us as much deepness into these things. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him realize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandments. And so what Paul is writing are, are things that we should take serious. They're, they're, they're you know, the Lord's commandments are through the Holy Spirit. And, and, and now you have people that will argue, well, if it's not written by Jesus, then don't follow it, is what they'll say. So they'll pull Peter's stuff out and say no. They'll pull James' stuff out and say no. But more than anything, they pull Paul's stuff out and say no. Well, that's not what the Bible tells us. That's not what we should do. We should follow everything. For a matter of fact, the scripture that I'm sure most of you know is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God. One version would say all scripture is God breathed. That's a wonderful picture of God just breathing the scripture into existence, if you will. It's profitable to teach you for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate. Another version will say the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so we certainly have a wonderful example in the apostle Paul. Imagine traveling down that road and that light that shines around you. Light is enough to blind you, to take your sight away. change your life. You know, that's what Jesus does to us, isn't it? Jesus changes our life. He came to seek and to save. Tonight, if you're not yet a Christian, we always have that opportunity. When we meet together, there's always an opportunity, and, and, and if we're not meeting together, it's always just a phone call or Text or something away to become a child of God, to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, to confess that belief before man, to be baptized, having your sins forgiven and washed away, and to begin that walk with Jesus, that living that Christian life. Oh, it would be great to do that. To it took something drastic. Saul did. 
It took a life from Jesus. It took a conversation from Jesus. But once he changed, he changed everything for the better. So maybe tonight we just need prayer. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. here this morning to partake of the Lord's Supper? Well, if that's not the case, then uh, I suppose I thank you all for coming out to tonight's Bible study and service. And if 
we'll bow our eyes in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, holy is your name. Father, I thank you for this wonderful day on earth you've given us and the opportunity and freedom we had to gather here to learn your word and worship you. Please be those previously mentioned on the prayer list so they can clear their lives, bonus and grief alike. Please be with each of us so we might hear what so we might take what we heard here today and apply it to our everyday lives as we go our separate ways. And please be with us, each of us to be so we might be safe as we do so. It's your son's grace to be prayer. Amen. I got up my brain. I swear I said.